Welcome to the broadcast of Riverside Church in Princeton, North Carolina. Riverside Church preaching Christ and Him crucified. For more information, check out our website at www.riversidefwb.com. First Corinthians 6, 9 says that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will get to heaven. Many critics claim that passages like this one in 1 Timothy 1, 10, which label homosexuality as sin, are poorly translated. They say the Greek word that appears there, arsenokoite, isn't actually a word at all. In fact, there is no Greek word for homosexual. But in understanding the text, it becomes evident that by Inventing the word arsenokoite, the Apostle Paul is calling to attention commands from Leviticus, which condemn a man, arseno, from lying with, koite, another man, arseno, as one would lay with a woman. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the words arseno and koite lay next to one another. Uh, no pun intended. So arsenokoite is the joining of two words to make one new one. The Bible strictly forbids homoerotic behavior. Yet a number of churches have come forward to approve such practices, believing that it's unloving not to. But do not be deceived, Christian. To encourage someone in sin that the Bible says will keep them from eternal life is not loving. You should know the Bible also says that those who approve of such behaviors are just as guilty as those who practice them. James 5.19 says if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, he will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We all once lived out the passions of the flesh, but we're washed when we repent and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ when we understand the text. Genesis chapter 44. The last time we spoke, we spoke about Joseph. It seems like I hadn't spoken in a while. I've been sick and things have came up. But Joseph, Joseph being an analogy, a foreshadowing of Christ. We see it throughout all of Genesis as Joseph, one who will save his people. Much like Jesus saves his people. In Genesis chapter 44, we're going to move quickly through this whole chapter. But we must recant and remember, or recount and remember 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6. As you remember in verse 34 of verse chapter 43, he brings out portions from Joseph's table to Benjamin. Remember his brothers are all gathered there. And Joseph seats his brothers in a position from oldest to youngest. And he gives five times as much of of portions to his youngest brother, Benjamin, to test his brothers. This is the first test that they'll see. He was testing his brothers because now at this point, Joseph is around 39 years old. He has not seen his brothers in about 22 years. Are they still the same? Do they still harbor resentment towards Joseph? Has it now been transferred since Joseph is considered dead in their family? Have they considered the anger and the jealousy and placed it upon Benjamin at this point? Joseph wants to know. And in verse 34 of chapter 43, portions were taken from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. Nowhere do we see in this chapter that they cut their eyes at Benjamin. That Reuben was an angry or Judah or Zebulun. That Simeon was not mad that here Benjamin, the youngest of them, receives more than them. Maybe it's possible the heart has been changed. 22 years is a long time. But in 22 years there's a lot of people who have not walked in sanctification, who have not grown in holiness, who have not forgiven But it just so happens through the power of God, these brothers were able to show compassion on Benjamin. And now in 44, you'll see the second test that will show that Judah's heart had changed. As we began chapter 44, and then he commanded the steward of his house, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of the sack. Now, you remember a couple chapters back where he's done this before to his brothers. He's put the money back in their sacks and here he does it again because he's not going to cause his own family to buy sustenance. 
He only sells to the Egyptians. He takes their land and their property. He even buys their bodies as they sell themselves into slavery to keep from starving. But he does not does that. He does not do that to his own kin. We must understand that Christ is our elder brother. He does not tax us. He does not beat us into submission. He is our God and He is kindly to us. Amen, somebody. In verse number 2, And they put, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for the grain. And they did as Joseph told him. In verse number two, this cup is a is a uh, it's almost like a sepulchre. It's a it's almost like a, a crown. It's a position in the in the economy of Egypt. This cup means that he was a, a vicer. This means that he was someone of great importance in the e- Egyptian economy. See, at this point, there's been a new pharaoh, as history tells us, that the pharaoh that had the dream has passed on about a year into the famine. And now he's called a visser, which means that Joseph is one of the elders of Egypt. That this young pharaoh looks to Joseph for understanding and wisdom. Because remember, he had the nickname of the one who knows the secrets of God. And now he had the silver cup of a position. And he has his servants hide the cup in his young brother's sack. In verse number 3, as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. In verse 4, they had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when you have overtaken them, say, Why, why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from my Lord that, that my Lord drinks that, that this is, he has practiced divination? You have done evil in doing this. Now at this point, you might look at verse number 5 and say, Divination. Are you saying that Joseph was into witchcraft? Was he speaking to foreign gods? No, you must realize that Joseph was a follower of Yahweh. He followed the God of the Scriptures. However, he had to keep up appearances for his brothers for they needed to be tested. Divination. To them, he was just a pharaoh. He was an official in the Egyptian government. He was one who was a pagan. And he had to keep up the ruse before his people, before his brothers. In verse number 6, And when he overtook them, he spoke to them these words, and they said to him, Why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we have found in the mouth of our sacks we have brought back from the land of Canaan. Now the brothers are showing their integrity. They're saying, before when we had the money, we brought it back to you. Why would we even do this? In verse number 8, Behold, the money that we found in the mouth of our sacks we brought back from the land of Canaan. How could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? And now they bank on their integrity and their character. And verse number 9, Whichever of your servants is found, with it shall die. And we will also be my Lord's servants. They are showing their integrity and their character to that servant. They're saying, whoever you find this cup, they will be your slave and we shall all... No, actually they said, that person will die and we will sell ourselves to Egypt. We will be your slaves. In verse 10, he said, Let us be as you say. He who is found with it shall be my servant, and the rest of you shall be innocent. In verse 11, each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack. And he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest. Verse number 12, I want you to notice that this servant was instructed on a certain thing. He began with the eldest to the youngest. If you remember the last chapter, when Joseph came into the banquet hall with his brothers, he set them from the oldest to the youngest. Almost like he knew. They were puzzled. How did this pagan king that they don't even know knew who was in the birth order. So obviously the servant had inside information. He began with the oldest and worked his way to the youngest. That should have been a red flag for them to figure out. Things are not what they seem. But he began with the eldest, Reuben, and worked his way down to Benjamin. In verse number 12, he searched beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. 
This is a horrible thing. Can you imagine these brothers? Truly, we can see from Scripture, we can see from the dialogue, their hearts have been changed. They, they sold their brother to begin with Joseph into Egypt. And they had to live with the repercussions every day of their sin. Now, we all teach here at Riverside that Jesus forgives sinners. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, that you forgive sinners. But many times, he does not, give, he does not wipe away the, 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 the result of sin. He doesn't, give away, he doesn't wipe away the consequence of sin. Sometimes we have to deal with those. We have to deal with the consequences of sin. Let me explain. There once was an unruly child, and every time he would dishonor his mother or his father, he'll break a household rule. His father would go out and put a nail in the garage door. And long before all, the door was filled with nails. And then an unruly, rebellious child comes to his parents and says, Mommy, Daddy, I'm sorry for the way I've lived, what I've done. I repent, I recant, I relent, I'm sorry. His father begins to pull the nails out of the door. And lo and behold, there are no more nails in the door. However, there's still holes in the door. Some sins that we commit and some sins that we commit against other people and people have committed against us, we still deal with the consequences. That divorce, we still have to deal with it. That broken relationship, that toxic relationship, we still have to deal with those consequences. Even though the forgiveness has been given, sometimes we have to deal with the consequences just like the brothers here at this point. They still deal with the consequences of selling their brother into slavery, breaking the heart of their father. And now it seems like it's caught up with them all over again. So what do they do? Verse 13, they tore their clothes and every man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. Verse 13, as they ripped their clothes, they shred their clothes and relent and cry out and laminate before God. God, how could this be? Nowhere here in the next few verses you'll see anybody point their finger at Benjamin and say, what did you do, you kid? What behind the ears, crazy kid? You, you get out away from your daddy and you just go and steal the king's cup? Nobody berates Benjamin. Nobody blames each other at this point because their hearts have changed. But they tear their garments. Think back 22 years earlier. If Joseph was caught with a golden cup from an Egyptian king, what would the brothers do? They would point and say, you idiot, why would you do this? You foolish young man. Look, they're going to they're gonna ruin you. They're going to shred you. You'll be a prisoner here in Egypt forever. And we're quickly going to sell you out. But no, the brothers don't. They rip their robes and cry out in anguish because God has done a work in their heart. And they return to the city. Verse 14, and Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house. Notice in verse 14, it says, and Judah. But Reuben's the oldest. But Reuben has to live with the consequences of his past sins. Remember when Reuben laid with his father's concubine. He forfeited his birthright. He forfeited the respect. He forfeited the patriarchism of his heritage when he disgraced his father and dishonored the marriage bed. And now the right and the leadership falls on Judah. But Judah, do y'all remember Judah? Judah was the one that says, let's kill Joseph. Let's slaughter him. No, no, no. Let's don't slaughter him. Let's sell him to the Midianites. Judah, is he better off at this point? You remember there's a whole chapter, chapter on Judah and Tamar. How he showed no integrity and no character. But as years have passed, God has done a work in Judah. God has captured Judah's heart. When Judah naturally should do nothing but grow colder, more vile over time, God has softened his heart. Thank you, Jesus, because I'm speaking to Judah tonight, someone here, and maybe he might even be preaching. When naturally my heart is dark and wicked and cold, naturally, God can soften a hard heart. 
God can take a stony heart and hit it with a hammer, crush that heart until it beats again because that's the kind of God we serve. I want you to see the process of Judah. (laughs) See the process of Judah, how God works in his heart. How God did not simply leave him in his devices. Did not leave him in the graveyard of rebellion, but quickened his heart, bringing him to life, having compassion on his own brother, regretting what he did to his other brothers, taking responsibility. In verse 14, And Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was there. They fell before him on the ground. Oh, don't you remember, church? Don't you remember Genesis chapter 37 when 22 years ago, around 17 years old, told his family, there'll be a day when my brothers will bow down to me. There'll be a day when the sun and the stars will be at my feet. That day's today. Here he sees his brothers prostrate before him. He does not gloat, but I'm sure God conjures up in his memory to remember The promise he gave him and now is fulfilled. Joseph doesn't gloat here. He doesn't pimp walk out. He doesn't pop his collar. He doesn't walk like George Jefferson in front of them. And he doesn't rub it in their faces. But here, they prostrate themselves before him and on the ground. And Joseph said to them, What deed does this you have done to me? Do you not know that I'm a man like me, that I can indeed practice divination, still keeping up the rooms of a pagan Egyptian? And Judah said to him, What shall we say, O my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out our guilt of your servants. Behold, We are my servant, my Lord's servants. Notice he says we. Judah, when he was so quick to sell his brother to the Midianites to make a couple of pocket change, now says we. We stand together. We're family. We're brothers. We are your servants now. Even though Benjamin was caught with the cup, we. God has worked worked in Judah's heart. Judah is a man now. What do you mean, preacher? Listen to me, men. Be responsible. Grow a backbone. Even if somebody in your household failed, it's not your fault, but you are responsible. Be a man. Here, Judah is being a man, being a leader. He stands before this king condemned and he says we instead of pointing fingers and casting blame he says we including me. He's saying oh great leader of Egypt I'm the greatest sinner here. I take responsibility. Me and we instead of casting blame on the young framed Benjamin. A lot different than 22 years earlier. Thank you for the long suffering of God who works with people. Amen. I'm not the same person I was 22 years ago. Thank you, Jesus. But thank you, Jesus, that in the process, he didn't just throw his hands up and say, this one's a lost cause. I've progressed in sanctification. Truly, I'm not where I should be. Thank God I'm not where I was. Thank you, Jesus, you're still working it out. I still got, I'm still impatient. I still got problems. I'm still angry. And I still deal with stuff. And I still deal with it day by day. But thank you, I forgive a little more than I did yesterday. I thank you that I showed a little bit more grace than I did 10 years ago. Thank you that I'm not as mad as I used to be. I've progressed and I've grown like Judah in this story. Thank you, Jesus, for not giving up on me, working with me. Thank you for the long suffering and the grace. And if you have not found any growth, if you have not found any patience and increase of peace, then truly you have not repented and walked with Christ. This is called progressive sanctification. Once you walk this out, there are actually people who believe you'll get up from this pew, fall down on your face before God and all things are wiped away. Oh, you're perfect and you're at peace and you don't have anything else to deal with. But no, that is not true. Jesus walks with you in the middle of the process. 
He grows with you. He keeps you because if you instantly stood up from this, this altar and all things are clean and all relationships are right now, no more problems, and you walk away, you know what truly will happen to your soul. You will grow in pride. And you will not show mercy and grace with somebody in the middle of the process still trying to work it out. Amen. So we see Judah. Judah has grown. He, his heart has grown soft. He now shows compassion where he didn't show compassion. And in the process along the way, God was with him. Judah, I know you're here today. And you're not what you used to be. And you're far from perfect. But God has kept you. And He keeps you. He walks with you. And He talks with you. He tells you, you are His very own. Your prayer life has grown. You've wept more than you've ever wept. You have a desire to read Scriptures. Not a desire you believe that every day it grows more and more. You're still working on that. But you read your Bible. Amen. You, you come to church. You, you have a commitment to learn about Him. You desire to want to know Him more. To know Him more intimately. You've grown. And to that, I don't give you credit for I give God credit. Because truly... Truly, you wouldn't run after him. He chases you. Amen, somebody. Well, that's good, and y'all know that. Let us continue. I know we're getting close to 8 o'clock, but y'all give me a couple minutes, won't you? Come on. He keeps up the rules in verse 15 that he's a man who practices divination. In verse 16, Judah cries out. And he says, how can, we, how can we show ourselves to be innocent? Our guilt has found us out. We're your servants. We are. Both we. He also in whose hands the cup was found. In verse 17. But he said, Far be it that I should do so. Only the man whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up to your place to your father. Here he tests his brothers. Hey, I'm giving you off the hook. You just leave Benjamin here and you go on back to Jacob. Go on back to your father. Now, don't worry, I'll punish Benjamin. 22 years ago, they would have been happy to say, hey, okay, I'm going on to the house. You handle this. He, he's the one who took the cup. And how does Jude respond as he's the spokesman, spokesman for the brothers? And when Judah went up to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears. And do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. This brother is, his brother is dead, and he alone is left with my mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me, and I'll set my eyes on him. In verse 22, we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with me, you shall not see my face again. In verse 24, then we went back to your servant, my father, and told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, go again and buy us a little food, we said, we cannot go down, for our youngest brother goes with us, and we will go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then our servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, surely he has been torn into pieces, and I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you will bring my gray head down to Sheol. Here, Judah, in the last few verses, is explaining his father and the predicament. Oh, Lord of Egypt, we can't leave, we can't leave Benjamin here. You don't understand. See, this young boy has a father who's got many gray hairs. But the thing is, he has gray hairs, but his heart is with this child. He had a brother before. He is no more. And that nearly killed him. But now here is Benjamin. Here, 
It's his beloved. Judah before was jealous of the position of Joseph and hated it. But now we see Judah defending Benjamin before this king. Judah's heart has been changed and truly all the hearts of the brothers. God has done a great work in this family. I don't care how messed up your family is or how complicated everything is. I don't care what kind of eggshells you got to walk on around people. It's not bigger than God. He can handle the situations. Even complicated, twisted, uh, offended, angry, and bitter. Years and years of resentment. There's a God who's able to heal in a moment. Even though it took him 22 years for this situation, there's a God who can simply nod in your direction and favor will flow into your life, healing you and those around you. Amen. <laughs> Judah here is defending his brother. Can you, can you feel the excitement in Joseph's heart? It's surely leaping within his chest. He didn't, he, see, here was, here's how our hearts operate. He can get bitter here and say, well, Judah, you didn't defend me like that. And he can actually become jealous of Benjamin himself as Joseph because that's how deceitful our hearts are. But no, Joseph loved the Lord God Almighty. And he loved his brothers. You might even say here in this moment that this is a bad thing. That Benjamin is on the hook this is a horrible thing. He could face execution if not a lifetime of slavery. But we must realize who orchestrated all of this. His name's Joseph. Joseph planned all this and he had good intentions to test the hearts of the brothers and to even see how his brother Benjamin was looked at in their eyes. Now let us step back and look at the situation again, but in the New Testament, when you face trials and tribulation, whenever... They pull down the sack and the cup is there in the mouth. Whether you put it there yourself or it was planted there. And it's a bad situation. Whether it's cancer, loss, brokenness. And it's found and it was placed there in your life. It was placed there by Jesus for your good. You're not understanding what I'm saying. Joseph planted the cup there. His intentions was good for his brother's. But we have a high priest. We have a big brother who orchestrates all things. A God who's in control of all things. A sovereign God who rules and reigns forevermore. And whatever I face, whatever storms come my way, whatever rain beats against me where I'm so blinded I cannot see, it's for my good. Whatever drives me to my knees drives me closer to Jesus. Amen. Whatever torments Whatever broken things come my way will make me more in His image because He orchestrated it. Do you not see the analogy of Joseph and Jesus? Joseph simply reigned over Egypt. But our Jesus, our Jesus reigns over all creatures. Our Jesus calls us to hide. For those who are wondering, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You know, that is true. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But boy, it sure does make it easier. Let me explain something, something important. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to tithe. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to do anything. Get this, TV Land. You get to. You get to go to church. You get to rub elbows and work out your faith with fear and trembling with other believers. You get to go into the house of the Lord and hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't you want to gather with a bunch of people who love Jesus and hear about Jesus and what He's done for people like me? Why wouldn't you want to? Why wouldn't you want to donate your hard-earned money to a church that's spreading the good news of the gospel of how Jesus takes the addicted and sets them free. How he opens up the doors of the prisons and set at liberty those who are chained. Why wouldn't you want to?